East Community Reinvestment Areas. We will also hear a brief update to City Council regarding the 2019 CRA report. This evening, we will hear from the Department of Development, as well as representatives from Herman and Kittle, National Church Residences, and Metro Development. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my colleague, Council Member Rob Dorns. Council Member Dorns, would you like to make any remarks this evening? Uh, Chair Faber, thanks for having me tonight. Excited to hear from all the presenters. Uh, just appreciate you taking the time to host this hearing to make sure that we're uh, providing as much transparency on these issues to the public as possible. So thanks for holding the hearing and appreciate everyone, uh, including the Department of Economic Development for their work in bringing the hearing together today. So uh, I will sit back and, and learn. Thank you, council member. These hearings are important to our work here at city council as we strive to encourage an open policy making process. I truly value these opportunities to hold these hearings to engage with our residents, ask questions, and become more informed on the important decisions on behalf of each, our, each of our residents. I do want to ensure our area commissions and civic associations that we value your feedback and my office is committed to improving this process moving forward to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to ask questions about these proposals and understand not only how it will impact their neighborhood, but also how some of these tools can be utilized to their benefit. Affordable housing is a topic of critical importance in our community, especially as we are learning how to solve these challenges that have been heightened by the pandemic. Housing stability is more important than ever, and our residents in every neighborhood need safe, quality, and affordable options to support their families. Today, we're specifically taking a look at the Community Reinvestment Area, or CRA, as a tool to incentivize residential development and also encourage neighborhood revitalization and stabilization. The new residential incentive policy adopted by City Council in July of 2018 has made significant changes to support affordable mixed income neighborhoods in the city's post-1994 CRA areas. Neighborhoods have been placed into one of three categories based on the following criteria, population growth, median household income growth, poverty rate, growth in median rent, housing vacancy rate, and mortgage rate. As per the ordinance, the current incentive policy will be up for review next year. However, it's imperative that we take the necessary steps, which I have, to start that process now as we recognize the growing need for safe, affordable housing in our city. I also think it's important for us to level set and define what affordable housing actually means. The Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, defines affordable dwelling as one that a household can obtain for 30% or less of its income. Although it appears that we're building everywhere right now, we are significantly underbuilding, which causes rent and housing prices to increase. To meet the estimated demand of our growing population, we need to be building more than 14,000 housing units per year. And right now, we're only building around 8,000 units a year. The only comprehensive way to lower prices is to increase the supply of housing. I'd now like to introduce Director Michael Stevens from the Department of Development to make introductory comments. Director Stevens. Thank you, Chair Favor, Council Member Dorans. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Chair Favor, I wanna thank you for holding this hearing, um, I think it's crit critically important that we talk about these incentive tools that we have available to us to encourage the ongoing investment within our community. If we want to achieve prosperity for all, we need to continue to fuel um, that growth and that opportunity with new development, but we also need to do it in a way that is, is equitable and mindful of the needs of our community, especially around safe and affordable housing. Um, I think you very well captured our approach to um, our policy and, our, and, and the need for more housing units being developed in our community. Um, it, it's an important 
part of our success as a community, our ability to attract jobs and investment, uh, the housing and the availability of housing is a key component of that. So I, I, I'm, again, thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk about these projects before us tonight, but also to talk about um, the ongoing need to address some of the housing issues we have in our community. Uh, on behalf of the mayor, I, I know I appreciate the partnership that you and your colleagues at council bring to this important issue. And I look forward to working with you and, and other members of council. We have our development team here with us tonight to do a little deeper dive into our approach as using these incentives to drive development, as well as to report out as we do on an annual basis on the success of this policy to date. So uh, thank you again. And if it's okay, council member, I, I would like to ask Hannah Reed to do a little deeper dive on why we uh, use these tools to encourage this type of investment. Absolutely, thank you, Director. Hannah? Thank you, Chair Favor and Council Member Dorans and everybody else uh, at the hearing with us this evening. I'm gonna take a little bit deeper dive into the incentive policy that Council Member touched on in her opening comments and um, the updates that were made in 2018. But before we go into that, I just wanna do a quick recap and overview for the audience, reminding them what a tax abatement is and, and how the tool is used uh, to encourage the development uh, in these areas. So a property tax abatement is a type of incentive that reduces or eliminates the property tax on the increased value created by an investment for a defined period of time. I know a lot of questions that when I'm out in the community with some of the members of our housing team are, well, 15%, I'm sorry, a hundred year, a hundred percent for 15 years, is that totally everything? And it's not, it's only on the increased value. So if you're paying a hundred dollars for the land, it's only the abatement is only on the improvement, the vertical that's coming, the improvement to that land. That's what your abatement is on. You are still continuing to pay the taxes that you're paying today on that property. Likewise, if you're making a renovation, um, or an improvement to a property, it's only on the increased value post renovation. You are still paying the current taxes on the value of the property prior to the renovation. So it's not a complete zero. Um, just as a re just for a little additional information for uh, the hearing this evening. And a couple of other things that abatements do or do not do. So just to reiterate, like I said, they do not reduce the current taxes being paid on the piece of property. Um, and they don't have any value unless the developer or a property owner invests money in improvements to build something new or refurbish an existing building. So if you if there's an abatement in an area and you don't make it any improvements, you don't make an improvement to your house, nothing happens. Um, and another piece that we've had a couple questions come our way is, does the CRA override zoning? Does it act as a zoning change to a community? And it does not. So if there's a CRA in an area and um, a person comes in to buy a piece of property and would like to develop a residential uh, development, and it's currently for manufacturing, they still have to go through the rezoning process. The CRA does not override the zoning. So, um, just a couple, couple clarification pieces before we go forward. Um, and then going back to the policy that we have um, updated in 2018, to council members point, there are six distress criteria to help categorize our CRA. And each one of those categories have different requirements based on the level of distress criteria in that neighborhood. Um, the three categories are market ready, those are the areas that are meeting the fewest distress criteria where the market's really taking over and there's more value that the city can get out of that abatement for a public good. And in this case, public good is affordable housing, is the public good that is captured by the abatement. Ready for revitalization is that middle tier where uh, it's meeting two to four, I believe, uh, distress criteria. And that's where the market is it's, it's coming along, it's right there, but it's not, it's not quite as strong as those market ready areas. And then the ready for opportunity areas 
are areas where the abatement alone is not enough to make the project pencil out. There are usually additional tools, additional resources put into a project to make them come to fruition. So the three areas that we are going to discuss, the three proposed areas this evening, um, all happen to fall into that ready for revitalization category, which is that middle tier that I talked about. So just to reiterate, or to go over what the requirements are in that area, it's 100% for 15 years, and that's standard across all three areas. Um, eligible projects are single family new construction, single family renovation, and then multifamily projects that are four or more units are required to set aside 10% of their units that must be affordable and rented to residents at 100% of the area median income and 10% of the units at 80% of the area median income. And reminder, it's affordable and rented to. So uh, the tenants will be income qualified to assure that the folks in that income uh, in that AMI bracket are able to access those units in that price range that are priced for them. Um, there are There is a buyout option, and I will say none of these projects are taking that. Um, Hannah Jones, at the end of the, the hearing, will be able to talk about uh, the agreements that we have from 2019, and I can tell you that in that report, in the calendar year of 2019, no uh, developers had chosen to take the buyout option. Um, the buyout option in this category, just for informational purposes, is a $5,000 per required affordable unit payment to a local CDC. So if you have a 100 unit project and you're required to have 20 units set aside, it's 20 units times $5,000 to the CDC. Um, going on, for the last piece of the policy update that I want to touch on tonight is the determination of how boundaries of new CRAs are created. Um, based on census tracts, which is a data-driven approach, we are now creating CRAs. I know that um, some of our, we'll call them our older CRAs are, that were done prior to this policy have very large geographies and aren't always reflective of the different pockets of development within a neighborhood. Um, so census tracts tend to be smaller boundaries, they're data driven, and the data that we use to qualify an area is based on census tract data. So uh, I have the information and I think we'll touch on it as we go through the hearing this evening of which census tracts that these areas were based on, but that was the last piece of policy information um, that I wanted to cover this evening, unless council member favor, council member Dorrance have any other questions. Council member Dorrance, do you have any questions? Not this time. Um, I have a few questions uh, for Director Stevens or um, for Hannah. Uh, to date, how many CRAs have been created? We did two CRAs in 2019, and then we have done four in uh, 2020. So since the new policy in 2018, we have actually created six. And then with these three tonight, that'll be a total of nine post uh, policy changes in 2018. So this is a rather new incentive policy, which uh, just to remind residents, it's up for a review every three years. What was the incentive policy prior to what we're working with now? Uh, I, oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, Hannah. Uh, Chair Favor, our incentive policy was not as structured as this, and nor did we require the level of affordability in um, setting up these abatements. Thank you. Um, when we're talking about uh, creating uh, these CRAs, uh, we hear developers, obviously we've got three developers uh, on uh, this, as a part of this hearing this evening, but what about um, everyday owner occupied um, homes? Can a, a regular person, uh, so to speak, um, take advantage of this incentive policy? 
uh, whether they are a small developer, a uh, rehabber or a contractor, or uh, they live in their home and they want to make improvements. So for the owner occupied piece, uh, we made sure to include the ability if the an owner is going to make an, an improvement and continue to occupy it, we gave the policy provides the opportunity for that owner to um, have the value that the increased value in the property tax abated based on that uh, investment. Uh, for more of a smaller developer, I believe, and I'm, I'm going to look to um, the housing team to fill in the details, but I believe it requires at least four properties um, that need to be done to qualify for that. And I will go to read our hand up for confirmation. Good evening, Director. Um, there are single family properties that are eligible in the rehab category for abatement. The requirement for a single family property is that you make an investment of at least 20% of the value or $2,500, whichever is greater. And uh, just to clarify, uh, Rita, thank you for joining this evening. That uh, homeowner or whoever owns the property at that point uh, would still be paying it, their base tax. It's just the, correct. Just the abatement on the improvements to the property, correct? That is correct. What happens at the end of the abatement period? So the, the abatement is basically not charging the taxes. So when the abatement period ends, the property becomes fully taxable. And um, Hannah, you acknowledge that the three properties that we're going to be discussing this evening would fall into the ready uh, for revitalization category. Um, and you acknowledge that uh, for, uh, I guess, for, to frame the conversation correctly, could you highlight a few of the communities uh, that fall within that category already? Sure. Um, let's see here. Uh, Wyland Park is one, the South Side CRA. Um, and those were two that were existing prior to this policy um, in 2018. So they are larger geographies. Um, those are two of them. I'm trying to think uh, what the name of one of the ones we did in the the spring was that was ready for revitalization. Not the quarry and Granby Crossing were both market ready. Northland. There we go. I'm looking at Amy Rosenthal right now. Yes, the other, the most recent Northland one was also a ready for revitalization um, that we did prior to recess this summer. And in that category, um, in order to uh, qualify for the abatement, the um, the developer must have set aside 10% of the units at 100% uh, AMI and 80% AMI. Can you just break that down to regular numbers for us? You're on mute. <laughs> okay, I'm off mute, but I wasn't very helpful. I saw Amy uh, looking for a presentation. I think it's included in hers. I don't actually have that chart printed in front of me, so let me grab it and I'll get back to answer that question for an exact okay. dollar amount for you. I have that included in mine, if okay. you let me share. Okay, well, we can wait. Okay. Okay. Well, it's actually perfect, perfect timing. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, jump into our presentations. Thank you, uh, uh, Director Stevens and, and Anna and Rita uh, for uh, those responses. And uh, Caroline, uh, we're going to hop right over to you. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Caroline Kimmel with Carmen and Kittle, Kittle excuse me, to discuss the development associated with the Far South CRA. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thanks for um, having me this evening. I'm going to try to get my presentation shared here. That look good. Can you all hear me okay? Yep, it looks good. Perfect. Um, so this uh, is the far south CRA, which um, we are working on creating here on the south side. Um, it goes from um, Southgate and South High Street all the way down to 270. 
Um, this is a pretty large CRA, um, but this area is very underserved right now when it comes to new housing stock. There is some affordable housing in this area already, but most of it is old and about 95% of it has a wait list or is 100% occupied. Um, and this area is also underserved with utilities. So it's underserved with two different types of investments that can further future investment in that area. Um, and so as part of the development of Windmiller Point Apartments, we plan to address uh, two of those issues, both the need for more new affordable housing stock and also the need for infrastructure improvements. Um, so this, this area from um, basically from Phelps here all the way down High Street to Williams, all of the businesses along High Street um, and some of the single family homes are currently being served um, with a septic system. And so part of our development, which I'll get into a little bit later, uh, will be to install a new sewer line that could then be um, have the capacity to serve businesses and additional developments along High Street. So uh, development description, we have, um, this is a map of the area of where the site is. Uh, this is the future uh, plan for Windmiller Point Apartments. And um, I think that this is an excellent location. Um, it kind of bridges the gap with the single family to the north and west and the commercial uses to the south. And having access to a bus line is also extremely important when developing affordable housing. So that was another um, reason why we chose this site. So Windmiller Point will include um, cottage style buildings as well as two and three story walk-up apartments. One, two, three, and four bedroom units will be available. Um, we're also including a freestanding clubhouse with an amenity center, including an outdoor pool, a playground, a bark park with agility equipment um, as pets are allowed and also a pergola with a picnic area and a grill, as well as a walking trail. Um, so these interior units I've included are more just for um, kind of generally what our finished levels look like. This is actually pictures of Whispering Creek Apartments, which is also in Columbus off of Haig Avenue on the west side. Um, and so this is what the clubhouse looks like there. And this is the same finish level that we will be featuring um, once Windmiller Point Apartments is completed. And so this is the, um, I'm not sure if you can see this or not. This is the um, rent and affordability chart that I think we were looking for. Windmiller Point is unique in the sense that we um, are using income averaging. So we have 50%, 60%, and 70% area median income affordability bands. Um, and so <clears throat> rents will be affordable for residents of Columbus and Franklin County earning 50 to 70% of area median income. So the chart to the right of your screen shows what that looks like at each level for one person, for a two person family, a three person family and four. So if you think about four, um, a four person family, uh, this is what the income would be. And then I also went ahead and included roughly what the hourly salary would be, assuming 40 hours per week, 50 weeks of the year. So a family of four with a parent earning $21 an hour to $29 an hour would qualify for a unit um, in Windmiller Point Apartments. So before I move on from this screen, does this answer any of the questions that we're sort of floating around when it comes to income. I know this doesn't specifically show um, the area median income, the 100% area median income. So 80 would probably be roughly $5,000 per year above this 70% band, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yes, actually it, it does. And I think uh, for, for residents and, and our viewers at home, um, it's important to once again uh, reiterate where our current incentive policy is at. Um, if one is going to receive an abatement, um, it's the requirement is 10% uh, of the units set aside at 100% uh, and 10% of the units set aside at 80%. This uh, project uh, will focus at the 50 to 70% um, AMI category as you've provided 
Um, and so it's going deeper uh, than, than what the, our current policy is. Yes, and the reason for that is also because um, of the type of program that we're using. Like um, Hannah mentioned earlier, there's multiple different incentive programs that sometimes have to be layered together in order to make these developments work. Um, and we are using rental housing tax credits, non-competitive rental housing tax credits and tax exempt bonds from the Ohio Housing Finance Agency. And so that kind of puts that extra layer of affordability onto the project. Um, and that is what is driving this income mix, as well as uh, private market studies that we've had completed through independent third parties. Carolyn, would you be able to uh, build this project without one or the other? Uh, so let's say, okay, go. Absolutely not. Um, in this case, in some cases, the answer to that question is yes. In the case of this development, the answer is absolutely not. The land was fairly expensive, but the biggest driver to the cost of this project is one, the $1.5 million price tag on the sewer expansion, which um, I'll get to a little bit later. But with that huge price tag, the project is already bursting at the seams um, in terms of its, of its uh, financial stack. And that's why the tax abatement is so important to getting this project done. Thank you. Um, not sure if this really matters. This is just kind of what is included in the rent and what is not included. Um, this is something that people ask a lot. Um, so something kind of unique is we're including washers and dryers in all of the units. So there's no laundry costs additional to the residents other than their utility bill. But um, you know, in most cases, families in affordable housing are often having to go to a laundromat and that is an extra cost and also time and um, having to step away from their families and their children in order to do that. So this is just um, one more effort to make people's lives easier. So I think that's something really important that I wanted to highlight. Um, just a couple more comments about quality and safety. I think it's really important to know that Herman and Kittle operates both high-end market rate and affordable housing. And we have the same background check program that we use for both and the same resident criteria that we use for both. So residents in this uh, development will be screened with the same level of scrutiny that someone living in a luxury downtown apartment would be. Um, we also have put some additional um, security measures onto this uh, development specifically, just because of some concerns that I heard from residents um, in the area about um, you know, how large the development was and things that happen at other apartment communities in the area. So I wanted our residents to know that I heard you and um, we are spending about $55,000 a year on a security system that includes 24 hour monitoring and recording for that exact reason. Um, and so that's something unique as well. We're also including services. Um, we have a supportive services partner in Homeport and um, Homeport is not a manager in any way. They're just going to be on site on occasion, um, which with COVID going on, there's probably gonna be a lot more virtual meetings happening. Um, and we are providing our residents with access to computers, printers, everything they would need to do a video chat um, within the clubhouse that they'll be able to reserve privately if they need to, or in the open areas of the clubhouse. Um, but residents will be given information, but this targeted units that we're including will have a services plan tailored to their needs when they move in. Um, so this could include services, extremely wide range, um, but that includes rent and food and utility assistance, um, on-site meetings with residents if they need to, um, anything from credit counseling, nutrition counseling, computer programs, financial wellness, and more. So this is another layer that we're putting on to this development to try to ensure that we're actually making an improvement in the neighborhood other than just building new housing. Carolyn, why is it important to uh, ensure that there are units that are set aside that uh, have uh, supportive services um, linked to them? So I think the goal is ultimately for people to be able to move in and stay with us. We don't want someone moving in and then six months later, they're having trouble paying their rent and they don't know what to do. They don't have anyone to turn to and they end up, you know, unfortunately having to be evicted a few months later due to non-payment. So what we do is we kind of interview people at intake and we sort of get an idea of where they are 
where they are financially, where they are with education, where they are with credit counseling, or any of these other items uh, that I've named and kind of try to set them up for success right from the start. Um, and that kind of prevents, it prevents turnover, it prevents um, future you know, issues, challenges that they might have to face. Um, so I think it's really to create a more stable community. Yeah, and you know, I, I definitely just want to uh, uplift that point um, as the city of Columbus is navigating um, you know, a housing crisis that we were already dealing with before COVID, but COVID has definitely uh, exasperated that, that fact. And so it's important to make sure, um, and, and our eviction crisis as well. Um, so it's important to highlight uh, developments that are, are tuned in to that, that and are, are ready and able to assist in our efforts. Yes, I agree. So this development has been unique in the sense that there has been an extreme amount of um, coordination and communication with the community. Um, we have a good neighbor agreement between Homeport, HKP Property Management, and the Seattle South Area Commission um, that will sort of just kind of outlines the responsibility of Herman and Kittle to the community um, to kind of be a watchdog on themselves and make sure that if there's an issue, and one of these other groups, whether that be the um, SSAC or Homeport sees an issue, then they have someone to contact on site right away that's going to be able to take care of the issue. Additionally, the site wasn't zoned, so we held four meetings with the Seattle South Area Commission um, and a Development Commission meeting. And then we had sort of a stopping point. Um, and that stopping point was due to the lack of clear path on what we should do about the sewer situation. So um, there was a long gap between um, development commission approval of zoning and council approval of zoning because we did not have a clear path to sewer. So uh, last summer, over, over a year ago, um, our civil engineer CEC Inc, which is based here in Columbus, uh, discovered that we did not have sewer access available to the site. Um, we started having conversations with the city then and had a meeting in December with development, public works, um, a couple of council members to discuss what our options were. And due to the potential for disruption to the local businesses, the option to go straight down High Street through the right of way um, was selected, even though this was the most costly, costly option. Uh, like I said before, this is a $1.5 million investment in the sewer. Um, that will ultimately service our property and any other um, future properties that would like to tap in. And Herman and Kittle will eventually be donating that sewer line back to the city of Columbus uh, once the time period has expired. Um, we have to own it for a certain number of years and then we'll be donating it back to the city of Columbus so they can maintain it. And the city would actually collect tap fees from future developments who wish to tap in. So none of those tap fees will be going back to Herman and Kittle. So mm -hmm. that donation um, back to us well has no benefit on the developer but um, could potentially benefit the city financially um, and then this is boring kind of talks about um, our just Herman and Kittle's resume I think um, it's just important to know that we have a long history in many states um, here in the development world but this will be our fourth development in the last four years in Columbus and the third affordable development. Uh, we have a market rate in that's actually in Grove City. Um, and so I just sincerely want to share my appreciation with um, how forward thinking everyone in Columbus is and how much attention is coming to affordable housing because not all municipalities are taking action the way they need to. And especially with the pandemic going on, I think it's going to become a bigger and bigger problem over time. So I just want to say how much I respect everyone's attention to it and, um, you know, trying to get ahead of this issue as much as possible and offer developers opportunities to build the kind of housing that people truly need and is often underserved. So happy to answer any questions about the development in general um, or anything else, or I can wrap up. On mute. Thank you, uh, Caroline. I appreciate that um, 
that uh, great presentation. And just to uh, remind uh, us again, uh, how many units is the project? This is 284 units. 284 units. And um, they will fall anywhere between 50 to 70% AMI and service uh, up to one to four um, unit families, correct? Correct. Um, Rita, I'm, I'm coming to you because I wanted to ask a technical question uh, since uh, Caroline brought up the use of tax credits. Can you give us a uh, just a high level overview of what that really means uh, and why they're necessary to the development of affordable housing? Sure, good evening again, council member Saver. Long-term housing tax credits as administered by the Ohio Housing Finance Agency are really what they say they are. They are tax credits. So investors purchase the interest in the property and then use the tax credits to lower their federal income tax obligation. Uh, this has become, over the period of time that the tax credits have existed, a commodity such that there is there are folks who package these and basically work with those investors who can leverage these opportunities to maximize investment. In a 4% tax credit property, it's probably somewhere in the vicinity of about 40% of the total development costs can be covered with the investment from these tax credits. And when you try to think about, well, why should we do this? The, the really simple answer is, is that um, for like all of us, when we go to purchase our first home or even purchase our first car, what we are really concerned about is what the monthly payment is going to be and whether we can afford it. And if you are able to buy down the debt to the project, then the, what is it going to cost you to operate it on a monthly basis and what it's going to cost for somebody to live there on a monthly basis is less. And that's what really drives the benefit to this. Right. I think just to add on to what Rita was saying, I think that what people, the way that she explained it is great. And you think of buying a car or buying a, or getting a mortgage, you have your debt and your equity and tax credits help lower that debt. So then our monthly payment, instead of being, let's, let's give the car example, instead of our car payment being $500 a month, our car payment is $300 a month, which means we don't have to charge as much rent. We don't have to pass that cost burden onto our residents, which allows us to keep rents lower for that full 15 years. Exactly. And I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, the point that I was trying to make. Um, and part of the reason why most of the affordable housing units that we see being built in this country really uh, come by way of, of some type of tax credit, whether it's the competitive form at 9% or uh, the non-competitive form at 4%. Would that be accurate, Rita? It is. Fine Great. summary. <laughs> uh, Council Member Dorans, did you have any questions in regards to this project? I know as Chair of Public Utilities, um, your department did an excellent job of uh, communicating uh, with uh, Herman and Kittle and laying out some of those uh, preliminary options. Uh, no questions, but certainly compliments to, to them for really working through both with the, the neighborhood and certainly to um, you know, get the utility issue fixed, which I know was not an, an easy task by by any means, and certainly appreciate them going the extra mile to you know not only get this done for their project, but will will eventually be a uh, a great benefit to that area of the city as well. Uh, to to Council Member Dorrance or to to Caroline, I'm not sure if you all know, uh, but do we have an idea of when a sewer line was potentially slated? Uh, to be installed in, in that in our in that area of Columbus, um, we didn't have a precise plan on um, when that when a line would be run there. Um, certainly within the the planning area, um, you know the goal of of public utilities is certainly to get as many folks off septic as possible within the limitations of what the capital budget looks like on an annual basis. Um, so it's difficult to say, you know, w without this project, it would have been X amount of years until uh, a sewer line would have been run based upon what our capital budget looks like. Uh, that said, this project is certainly bringing, you know, this resource to this area much sooner than certainly would have happened otherwise, just waiting for typical capital expenditure budgets from, from the city. Thank you, Council Member Dorans. And uh, to Caroline, thank you once again uh, for that presentation.
I'd like to now introduce Amy Rosenthal with National Church Residences to discuss the project associated with the 161 CRA. Uh, Amy, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Council Member Faber. Um, I think somebody needs to give me permission to share. There we go, I'm the presenter. Give me one second here. All right, everybody see my presentation? Or no? You guys are quiet. Yes, sorry. I, I, okay. <laughs> I was shaking his head. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. All right. Well, well good evening. Um, thank you, Council Member uh, Faber, for hosting the public hearing this evening. We're happy to be here and present. Um, not only the CRA request, but the project associated with that request. Um, you know, thank you, Council Member Dorans, as well. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, we're up for that challenge at National Church Residences to provide safe and affordable housing and meet the demand here in Columbus. Um, and with that, we have this proposed project, Salem. Uh, we have this project, Salem Village, and we've been working uh, on this project for for several years now. Um, and with the development team members today that are here. So thanks, um, Director Stevens and Hannah Jones and, and Hannah Reed and Michelle and Rita and Tracy. We appreciate your support and guidance along the way as we build senior um, affordable housing here in Columbus with services. So um, here is the 161 CRA with, that we our project is located in. Um, you can see that, that 71 is that brown boundary on the west side. Um, 161 is the boundary um, on the north. Uh, the railroad track Sinclair is the, um, the, wet, the, uh, the eastern boundary. And my screen just, there we go, um, with, with Mo Mo Morse Road to the south. Um, so that's, that is that census track that is home to the Salem Village Civic Association within the Northland community neighborhood. Oh. Uh -oh. I am not going, there we go, okay. Um, Salem Village, this is a, a rendering of our proposed project. Um, a little bit about National Church Residences. So National Church Residences, we're a local faith-based nonprofit senior housing provider um, with a national reach. And although we have a national reach, our headquarters are here in Columbus, Ohio, and we employ 3,000 folks nationwide. So we're not only a developer, we're also the, the management entity and oftentimes the service provider and in this case, we're all of those things too. We're owner, developer, manager, and service provider. Um, our mission, we originate from a Christian mission, um, a commitment of providing high quality care, services, and residential communities for all seniors. Um, the rendering here is of a community that we partnered with the CDC in Toledo, um, Valley Bridge. We opened that project up a couple years ago in partnership with a local CDC in Toledo, Ohio. Um, we talked about our national, pre uh, our national presence, but our headquarters really being here in Columbus. And so that Ohio footprint is rather, is rather strong for us. Here in central Ohio and in Columbus specifically, we have owned and operate over 30 um, senior housing communities. Um, across the country, we have over 330 communities, but 30 of those are in the, Colum in the city of Columbus. Um, we have recently been um, developing new communities across uh, the city. Um, there's some, some highlighted here. We broke ground recently on Northland Gate, not too far from this particular site. Salem Village, um, we have a, a, another project nearby, Britton Woods. So this is just a snapshot of projects that are in our pipeline in Central Ohio. Um, so we're expanding that footprint. Like I said, we're up for that challenge and, and ready to meet that need to provide safe and affordable senior housing for the residents of Columbus. And in, the, in this Northland neighborhood alone, we own and operate several communities. Um, we manage, um, there's a few of them highlighted here. So most of these are senior affordable housing communities. 
but we also have an adult daycare facility on 161. Um, so se several communities in this neighborhood. Salem Village is right here um, with that census tract just being right about um, not, not, not that much bigger than the, the, the area. We actually own a nearby, own and manage a nearby adjacent property called Worthington Place East, um, which of 40 units that we built um, about 10 years ago. So the basics about the Salem Village project. So this has been a longstanding partnership with the city. We actually purchased this land in 2017 from the land bank. Um, and we watched it, you know, it, it wasn't scoring and receiving to receive that low income housing tax credit. Um, but we had a unique opportunity to apply for um, a competitive national funding source through the US Department of Housing and Urban Development through the HUD Section 202 Supportive Housing for the Elderly Program. So short for HUD 202. Um, we applied for that competitive funding nationally in February. And um, we applied about a year ago, actually, and received that funding in February. Um, the HUD 202 program hasn't been funded in over a decade. And so we were really active with, with HUD 202s in the past. But as I said, it hadn't been a new funding source for over a decade. And you previously, we were talking about that low income housing tax credit program. And the low income housing tax credit program is really the only mechanism to build and provide capital to build and rehab affordable housing. Um, this HUD 202 is a, a unique funding source that also is available. Um, so we, we, the Salem Village project was one of only 18 awards in the country. Um, and three of only three um, in the state of Ohio only received three awards. So we're very excited to bring one of those national awards and the largest award in the country to Columbus. Our plan is to couple that award with the 4% low income housing tax credit program. So we still need that tax credit program to fill the gap to build these units. So this will be a new construction community for 76 one bedroom units, all age restricted. All of the units will be income and rent restricted under the low income housing tax credit program. So that means um, all units will be at 100% of the units, all 76 will be at or below that 80% AMI. And the unique piece, not only did the HUD 202 bring us the capital to fill that gap in a 4%, it also brought us 28 vouchers. So we'll have 28 units that will be able to serve deeply targeted, very low income seniors. Um, at or below 30%, at or below 50%. So we we're, we look forward to being able to not only build um, to the to the parameters set forth by the CRA program, but we are exceeding them. And even you know going in and having a subset for that very low income senior is extremely unique at a time when it's difficult to find that subsidy. So that subsidy would mean that we we are assuring that um, no resident will pay more than 30% of their income on rent. We have an approximate $11.7 million construction cost. Our timeline is to hopefully break ground this summer and open up the building in fall of, of, of um, 2022. Um, as I mentioned, we, are, we actually own and operate an existing community right adjacent to this. Um, and our, it is our hope that we can partner and do joint programming and joint services with the, with the two communities. But there's been extensive community outreach. Um, we've been working with the North, Northland Community Council for years, um, more recently with the Salem Civic Association as this particular project is in the Salem Civic Association. In fact, this evening, um, a few of my other teammates are attending the Northland Community Council meeting because we're going in for our variances on this property. Um, and about uh, uh, here, here later this evening, about 6.30. So that's really just the high level, the basics of this of the project, and hence the CRA request. Um, you know, some of the amenities that we'll be offering at Salem Village, all utilities will be included in the residence rent, um, washer and dryer hookups. We'll have free Wi-Fi. Um, the entire building, including the units, will be wired for wireless internet. 
and the residents can take advantage of that free of charge. And of course, that important service coordinator, you know, as a nonprofit organization, um, we, we believe in housing plus services. There's just no other way to do it. Um, we want residents to stay with us for home. We want the residents to move in and be home for life and providing them the services they need um, to make sure that can happen. This is a quick overview of the location of the site. It's, it's the grassy land area right there, the East Dublin Granville Road, Roche Drive, Bends Around. Um, that's our NCARE Suites community, the V-shaped building. And isn't that fancy? That's our site right there that we bought from the land bank just in 2017. It's another view of the site plan of the, of the, of the community. Some comparable units, um, accessible bathrooms, large open concept living room, and really uh, in, in, in community space that encourages, encourages our senior residents for social interaction. So once again, this is the 161 CRA that's being proposed this, this evening and um, our Salem Village project noted there on the location. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if you can um, further elaborate on the, the growing need for um, projects that focus specifically on uh, the needs of our aging population. I, we talk a lot about uh, the, the need for affordable housing, um, especially um, in, in light of uh, what has occurred through the pandemic. Uh, but we also need to bring attention uh, to um, a market that does not get as much attention as it should. Um, and this is what you all do. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the demand, it, as, as you were quoting some stats earlier, um, you know, it, it's higher than it's really ever been, and especially for the, the piece of the service component. Um, when we really started looking at this Northland community, we realized it had never received a senior new construct, a senior LIHTC award, low income housing tax credit award. Never, never. Um, it's, it's, that's crazy. Um, so we really set, put our sights and said, there's an opportunity here. There were members of the Northland Community Council um, that were saying, you know, please come here. You're already here. Can we figure out ways that you can expand your footprint here? Um, and we've done just that. It's, it's, it's to, when you start diving into on the, when you dived into the market study um, and the, the need is there. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, especially that need to fill the subsidized units. I mean, our market study provider, you know, we're, you're going to fill those up in, you're in like less than a month. Um, so we're excited about that. We're excited to be building out the footprint in Northland, a community that has been overlooked a little on the, for, especially as it relates to new senior low income housing tax credit. Yeah, and I, I think you kind of gave us a historical perspective of um, the journey to getting to this point uh, with Salem Village. You acknowledge that uh, National Church Residence has purchased the property uh, in 2017, and uh, that land has been vacant, uh, what is that, for the last three years, but that is not uh, for lack of trying uh, to bring new development to that area, uh, but for lack of winning a, a tax credit, um, correct? Yeah, I mean, it really, it wasn't so much about winning. It just never, it was never competitive. So mm -hmm. it, we, you could look at it and just tell from past rounds that the score that it would receive, it's competitive, would have never been high enough. Um, so we, we waited, we waited for the, the right opportunity and this new HUD opportunity um, came along. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, Rita, if you could, uh, we talked earlier about the 4% the uh, tax credit in detail, but now that uh, the competitive uh, version of that has been brought up, how many uh, uh, projects do we get approved annually in Columbus? So, Council Member Favor, 
The competition for 9% uh, or competitive long-term housing tax credits is very intense. And so we don't get a set aside each year and this is how many, how many projects we're gonna get or how many units we're gonna get. We really have to come together with our development community and put our best foot forward to be competitive. So in prior years, we've gotten, I think this year we got four. In prior years, we've gotten like five or, or, or six. So it's really an up and down. There's no steady amount. Now, the one exception to that, which I'm sure you're well aware of, is our FACT 50 program with OFA, in which we were allocated $3 million of low-income housing tax credits to, to allocate into one neighborhood. And luckily, you know, National Church Residences, along with Homeport and the Finance Fund, are partnering with us to do three projects in Franklinton, an area that is very quickly becoming a market rate destination so that we can maintain affordability in that neighborhood. But other than that, every year, we just really have to work at it, uh, partner with our nonprofit developers and our for-profit developers to cross the finish line and be as, as successful as we can. Yeah, and I think that, um, it, you know, be a good opportunity to acknowledge uh, some of our housing partners that are doing a lot of the advocacy work, uh, especially on the state level, uh, to really advocate for um some some fairness around this process uh, i know the affordable housing alliance and uh, the trust have been uh very committed to uh really highlighting the fact that columbus is the fastest growing city in the state of ohio uh and it's inconceivable that uh we went from receiving i believe seven awards last year to three or four this year um, and so that's, you know, a conversation for a different time, but it definitely does bring some context to the importance of making sure uh, we've got great projects that are going up and they're getting their fair consideration. Absolutely. And Chair Favor, you had asked some for some of the, uh, the stats and I, my apologies, but I was able to pull up some information and sh if you don't mind, I can just share. Sure. Um, so uh, Franklin County has this, um, Senior population is growing. It's the second largest population growth in the state. So from a county perspective. And in that Northland community, when you look at the senior population and trend that out for the next 20 years, the senior population in Northland will, will more than double. Will more than double. Wow. Thank you again. Uh, and also just to take a moment to acknowledge um, the um, the intent around making sure that our seniors have free Wi-Fi. Uh, you think about this environment that we're living in where if we didn't have Wi-Fi, we could not have this hearing right now. It, it just wouldn't happen. Um, we're navigating those um, obstacles for students who are trying and, and need to be able to connect in order to get their schooling. Um, and so understanding those barriers exist and uh, exist very greatly for our seniors you all are including Wi-Fi uh, and services uh, into the project. Yeah, it's much needed. It's much needed. And we see that it's come to it's we knew that before COVID and the global pandemic, but we see it even more now. It's it'll be instrumental um, and really life changing for our seniors as we link up that that connectivity to healthcare. And just a week, uh, 76 one bedroom units, uh, which are age cap uh, for residents who are uh, 62 years and older. Uh, and uh, there are 28 uh, units that uh, will be voucher recipients. Yeah, you got it. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. And last but not certainly, uh, certainly not least, uh, we have uh, Metro Development, so I'd like to introduce Trey Giller and Andy de Blasi with Metro Development to discuss the two projects uh, that will be associated with the Northeast CRA. Trey, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Favor. Really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to hear on the call for any fill-in information that you may from an organizational perspective. I have Andy who's going to do the actual presentation. Um, a little bit different than what we've uh, we've heard from the previous two um, presenters on what seems to be really great projects and well-needed projects in the city. Uh, we're a for-profit developer, so we do not uh, we do not compete 
uh, on the uh, on the tax credit side of the the business. Um, we do a, a volume here in the city so for just for reference over the past you know uh, ten years we've done over ten thousand uh, market rate uh, units in the city that are uh, would be considered workforce housing uh, anywhere from a hundred and fifty unit community to uh, Victoria Manor what we'll talk about today which is a four hundred eighty unit community and we really try to target the areas of the city that are underserved. We really feel like the, the the CRA is important in this particular area of the city because it is a, a ready for revitalization. It's it's in that mode where it's convenient to jobs, convenient to opportunities. However, no new product has been built and brought to the market uh, probably in the last 15 to 20 years. So there's a functional obsolescence in the marketplace uh, that we see an opportunity to fill with uh, with these two developments. So with that, I'll turn over to Andy Blasey. And if there's any questions through the project, please feel free to ask me or ask Andy as we go. Andy. Sure. Uh, Council member favor again. Thanks for having us on tonight. We are happy to be able to discuss uh, these uh, proposed projects and uh, moving forward with uh, the proposal of this CRA. Let me go ahead and um, share my screen here. Uh, Are you guys able to see that? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll start with our Woodfield Park project. As Trey kind of touched on, uh, we looked at both of these sites um, and, and started investigating them over a year and a half ago. And uh, as he touched on, uh, we felt this was an underserved area uh, and we did more and more investigation into the market and um, began to pencil out these two specific sites and we were having trouble uh, making the numbers work, at which time uh, we started discussions with um, Director Stevens and Hannah and got more educated about the CRA opportunity and felt this would be a great put, uh, a great opportunity to institute this tool and offer more affordable housing in this area here. Uh, so with that, I'll move on to some details about the project. Obviously, this is just a slide. This uh, depicts what our uh, building elevations will be, as well as some interior photos and examples of our clubhouse. Um, as far as the locations concerned of Woodfield Park, it's located on the west side of North Cassidy Avenue, uh, north of um, 670 and south of Agler Road. Uh, you can see from the map there. Uh, there are several notable employment and retail centers in the area, including the City Gate Industrial and Business Park, Port Columbus, the Defense Supply Center, Mount Carmel East Hospital, and obviously Easton Town Center to the north, which you're, you're all familiar with, I'm sure. Um, the improvements we intend to develop on this property uh, will consist of uh, 10 three-story breezeway-style walk-up buildings totaling 240 units. Uh, in addition to the units, so obviously the ample surface parking, a standalone clubhouse with a flat screen TV lounge, coffee bar, fitness center, expansive outdoor pool, and built in grilling areas for entertainment. Um, the development will also include 60 detached garages, which will be rented as well. And we will be extending sidewalks to and along Cassidy Avenue in order to facilitate easier access to the nearby public transit. Uh, the interior of the units uh, will include, obviously, a living room, kitchen. Uh, we'll have in-suite, full-size, side-by-side laundry closets, uh, ample uh, storage and closet space within the units. Um, we'll be using carpet in the bedroom and living areas, and then we'll be using vinyl plank, simulated wood floor, in the kitchen, bath, and foyers, two-inch wood floor blinds. All the floor, all three stories of the product will be nine-foot ceilings. Um, We'll be using a black appliance suite throughout the community. So just kind of a quick overview on those details. It will be a 240 unit community 
with 60 detached garages, 10 three-story buildings, and one standalone clubhouse. Uh, the size of this site is 9.95 acres, and, and the ground was a vacant. It, it was a vacant property uh, before we uh, enlisted these efforts to develop the property. Here is the site plan of the site. Uh, you can see where those 10 uh, three-story breezeway buildings will be located, as well as the detached garages uh, and the standalone clubhouse. Our entrance, entrance will be directly off of Cassidy Avenue. Uh, that will line up with Plaza Property Boulevard directly across the street there. Um, the affordability component uh, will include within our development in concert with the CRA uh, is 10% of the units will be offered at 60% uh, AMI rent and income levels, which equates to a total of 24 units. And 10% of the units will be offered at 80% of AMI rent and income levels, which is additional 24 units. Um, here's kind of an, a unit allocation based on the unit mix of our development. Uh, there'll be 16 uh, one bedroom units offered at affordable rate, 56 will be at market rate and there'll be 32 two bedroom units that will be offered at an affordable rate and 152 market rate units within the community. Uh, here's our floor plan of our one bedroom unit. Um, all, for, all of our floor plans consist of a, a center island kitchen design uh, with the living room, and, uh, room off of that. And all the units will also be equipped with an outdoor space, either a powder, uh, a private patio or balcony. Um, you can see the laundry closet as well. Um, and then the bathroom off the bedroom with the tub shower combination. Here's our two bedroom floor plan. Uh, kitchen design is, is obviously fairly consistent there, uh, as well as some interior photos of some of our comparable product, which we've built in the area. Um, here's more examples of our interior photos. I touched on the finish levels. Uh, will be higher end finishes within the, in the units themselves. Wood plank simulated uh, vinyl plank flooring, uh, high definition laminate countertops, uh, four panel wood doors. Um, so this should give you a feel for the quality uh, of the development to come. Um, from an amenity perspective, we're going to offer a on-site uh, standalone clubhouse. Uh, it will be a 4,500 square foot clubhouse uh, consisting of a cyber cafe, movie and sports viewing room, a billiards room, a lounge room with fireplace and the fitness center, a pool, uh, exterior pool with a large sun deck, building, uh, grilling, and eating area, as well as a patio with outdoor with an outdoor fire pit plays in um, walking paths throughout the community as well. Here are some examples of other projects we built throughout the city, uh, clubhouse interior photos. So that will give you definitely uh, a good flavor for um, the quality of the finishes and the amenities that will be offered in our community in Woodfield here. Again, touching on uh, the location of, of this particular development, um, you can see obviously it's, it's a long Cassidy. Uh, we worked with Columbus One and had them provide all the major employers in the Northeast area quadrant, which employed uh, 100 plus employees or more uh, to demonstrate how much demand there is for workforce and affordable housing in the area. Obviously, you can see the amount of companies that are uh, close by. Um, Hannah touched on uh, kind of a high level uh, discussion previously about uh, that only the improvement is going to be invaded. So uh, we don't have to get in the weeds on this slide, but this kind of depicts um, if, if the property were left in its vacant state, um, that uh, top Excel, those top Excel um, figures there show a 15 year uh, collection period there, which would only be $33,000 uh, based on our improvement and the new land value, which we'll transact out there. Um, that 15 year collection period will, uh, will grow to $1.6 million. So obviously there's um, an additional significant benefit from a tax collection period. And then I also included 
the subsequent 15 year period after the CRB, after the CRA abatement period expires, and you can obviously see there um, that's over $19 million in additional tax revenue for the city. This is just uh, more details on that, uh, some of the real estate tax data provided there. Um, so we talked about the three different categories for CRAs. Um, this particular census tract uh, does underperform in three of the six distress criteria. Those specific criteria for this census tract are population growth, media rent growth, and the mortgage foreclosure rate. Uh, the qualitative reasoning on why we felt this was a good opportunity for a CRA um, are, are kind of clear with uh, some of the points I've made about the location. Obviously, close proximity to uh, and, and access to 670, I-270, and 161 uh, located along Dakota bus line. There's two bus stops directly to the south of, of our proposed development along Cassidy Avenue. And then just the behemoth that is Easton Town Center. Um, there's close to 3 million square feet of mixed use space there, uh, over 50 restaurants, 30,000 people work within that immediate trade area. And obviously they, they need places to live and, and they need affordable housing. There's three hotels within that area and a 30,000 square foot conference facility. And since uh, 2017, uh, that particular area has added over 1,600 jobs. Um, so we obviously felt there, and, and the data certainly supports uh, that the area, there's a high demand for a workforce housing need here. And uh, we're, we're happy to be meeting it with this particular project. Um, those are the details of Woodfield. If you don't mind, I can go ahead and move forward with uh, the details of Victoria Manor as well and um, then we can have questions after if that's okay with you all. Sounds good. Okay, let me pull up uh, the Victoria presentation here. having some issues. All right, let me try to open this again. I apologize. Perhaps, or perhaps while he's doing that, Councilman Fleming, we can answer any questions. And I think it, once he gets that presentation open, uh, I think our projects are fairly consistent from amenity package um, and uh, kind of a unit layout uh, situation. So I think we'll probably just spend a little bit more time on the overall site and then answer any questions in order to be mindful of, of the group's time. Yeah, that's fine, Trey. I was able to get that open. Can you all see that now? We can. Okay. Yeah, Victoria, um, we can touch on that location as well. Um, it is along Stelzer Road um, on the east side of Stelzer between Stelzer Road and 270 and north of Agler Road and south of McCutcheon. So obviously within the same submarket as Woodfield uh, and it, it falls within the adjacent census tract. Uh, again, just to touch on the location, um, you guys are aware of uh, some of the drivers there and the notable uh, employment centers in the area. Uh, here we will be, we, we intend to develop 480 units. Uh, we'll have 120 detached garages. We'll be developing three or 23 story buildings, one standalone clubhouse. Um, here's the site plan. Uh, obviously, Stelzer Road is to the west there. 
uh, Codet Road will be our access point. We'll be improving that uh, in its entirety there. Uh, one of the um, nice geographic aspects of this site is the uh, wetlands preserve in the center of the community. Uh, with our site design, we've tried to maximize that as an amenity for our, uh, for our residents uh, going forward here. Uh, from an affordability perspective, again, um, we are going to be offering 20% of the community as affordable, which equates to 96 affordable units, 10% again at 60, and 10% again at 80. Uh, you know, this obviously exceeds uh, the present um, the present requirements on, on existing CRAs at 180. So uh, we feel good about that. As far as our unit allocation is concerned, these are the details of that. You can see the breakdown of uh, what number of units will be offered at 60 and 80 as it relates to each specific floor plan. We will have a third floor plan here. You've seen the, the one bedroom and the two. Uh, we'll have a third fl floor plan uh, that uh, is our two bedroom, two bath deluxe that also uh, ha has an office or den or could serve as a third bedroom here. That's um, over 1,200 square feet. We'll have 72 of those units uh, within the community. Again, interior photos there, the clubhouse and amenities uh, with the wetlands preserve here being um, a big differentiator from, from woodlands. Again, the, the employment uh, and the tax details. Um, but really, the challenge to us, um, and here, this particular census tract um, actually qualified or underperformed in four of the six distress criteria, uh, um, population growth, medium household income growth, medium rent growth, and uh, mortgage foreclosure rate. Um, so it is even a little more distressed than the uh, census tract that Woodfield is located in. Um, but the reality is when we were looking at these deals and continue to pencil them out, um, we could not be moving forward with these developments without the CRA, uh, particularly since we're financing these conventionally without the benefit of a tax credit situation. Uh, we're obviously using and investing our own equity in these deals. Um, what the CRA will allow us to do is provide for that 20% affordability component, which we know is critical to the ongoing growth of Columbus, and we know that it's it's a major issue that uh, we all need to participate in trying to address. Can you go back up to your the previous slide? Sure. Is, do you want me to walk through that a little bit? Yeah, well, it might be the, the slide before this one, I think that showed what was being, uh, what's currently being collected versus um, what will be collected after the abatement period. Yeah, that's correct. So right now the property is vacant ground uh, and it's, be, it's being assessed as such. Um, so that first year, that 2022 year, uh, at, at the top of the slide there uh, is what the, the ground is currently valued at using the current millage rate. And what I did here is I trended that value, the auditor's value on the ground at 2% annually uh, to arrive at uh, that 15 year collection of just shy of $140,000. Um, just below that uh, is uh, an example of what, would, what will be collected um, based on our new development with the CRA in place, we are obviously still going to be taxed on the land only value based on what we're, we'll be paying for the ground. Um, so you can see uh, it's significantly higher than the current value. Um, and you can see the annual collections as trended at 2% escalations there to, be, uh, to where it would be over that 15 year period. Uh, the total tax collections would equate to over $1.5 million. Obviously, um, about eightfold of, of what they would other or actually more than that, about tenfold uh, of what they otherwise would be if it remained vacant property. And then uh, what's even more compelling 
are is the next um, set of Excel slides there um, on the very bottom of the page. Uh, when the abatement does expire after the initial 15 year period, you can see what happens to tax collections once the improvement in the land is fully, fully valued on the tax roll. Thank you for that. I, I think it's just important, um, once again, in full transparency, um, to not only you know, provide that educational piece, but to further emphasize the, the point of the CRA is not only to stabilize, but also uh, to revitalize an area. Uh, and if we're looking at a collection of around 140,000, um, if there was no improvements made on the land versus, I think that's 35, is that correct? Yeah, 35 million over a 30 year period. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's quite a difference. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah, I think Councilmember Favre, that's a good point. And I think that's from an education and transparency, I think it's important to, to, to focus in on that. Uh, this property is, has been owned by the uh, um, Salem Baptist Church for the last 20 years and sat vacant. Um, you know, we've met with them many times, you know, and gone through the process with them. And I think they look at this as a legacy opportunity to revitalize something they've owned for 20 years, bring it to the marketplace, and then also bring that kind of val the, the affordability component, also that value to the, the marketplace over, over the next 30 years is a, is a positive stride for this area where, you know, as they tell me, as a, a large number of their, their parishioners do come from this particular area. So they're vested in, and I think it's an excellent use of this piece of property. And, uh, and I think the tax, taxes are compelling. It's a, you know, it's close to 50, these two communities combined are close to $80 million worth of vertical construction in an area that hasn't seen that kind of, uh, that kind of development in the last, you know, 20, 20 years or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that's important from, from an area perspective. And then what a CRA does for a, you know, what would be considered a for-profit developer to go into areas, take those risks, put those additional dollars up, give something back to the community, but also offset some of the, the cost um, as, of development, which which are increasing substantially as we sit today. Trey, you, you mentioned in your um, remarks initially uh, that uh, the type of development uh, that you all do definitely specialize in and um, multifamily uh, units. And, you know, as you know, Columbus is expected to grow to 3 million um by the year 2050 uh, why is it so important to like get these projects in the pipeline right now well uh, yeah i mean I, I think that's a that's a great question and i think i think the part of the the issue is that we're we're at such a uh we're such a we're kind of starting the race at you know 50 yards back from the other competitors based on what we need by 2050 to what we're providing on a daily basis today from a housing perspective and I think if, if these projects uh, with some of the other projects that we have uh, in the marketplace, they're going to substantially help. However, with the time it takes to get through the process uh, right now, you know, you're 12 to 18 months uh, entitling a process project, getting it through the, the engineering steps, everything that needs to be done. Um, so if we don't get these projects started today, 18 to, to 28, you know, 12 to 18 months from now, we won't have um, and these units that are very important in this particular CRA area and quadrant of the city, but also across the entire city where we're looking for a real, we're seeing a real, you know, lag in single family houses um, from a construction standpoint, just simply because of construction costs are driving so high, especially in the city itself. We're not seeing a lot of single family construction, multifamily construction is kind of filling the, fill the void that's left right now. And I think if, 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 if we as a community don't take advantage of opportunities that are there now, we're going to look back and say, you know, that next Amazon headquarters or that next disc can't come to Columbus because we don't have enough housing in order to deal with a large employer that may want to come into the marketplace as they do their studies. Thank you, Trey. Um, to, to Hannah or anyone from the Department of Development, this is a unique uh, project that we're talking about. Um, because we're um, putting two projects, we're talking about two projects that are going to be in one CRA uh, uh, from the onset. 
So I, I want to, I don't think we put up a picture of what the, the boundary looks like, uh, but I, I definitely want to continue in the spirit of transparency and ensure residents that we weren't trying to be cute with the design of the, the boundary. Yeah, I, I wasn't provided that. I would have included that in the presentation, but I don't know. Hannah, is that something you have at your disposal to share? I do have the map pulled up. So if I'm able to share my screen, I can uh, put it up for for the group. There we go. Uh, okay, can everybody see that? I think we're sharing. Yes. Okay, so this is actually a combination of three census tracts, and this is the first time since the policy in uh, July of 2018 that we have done this. Um, this project right here uh, was this, I don't have the full map, this is just the boundary, but this little corner right here was the only portion of the census tract that was actually located within the city of Columbus boundaries. Everything else was to the right of my screen, which is a different jurisdiction. It's township, it's city of Gahanna, and we as the city of Columbus are not able to overlay a, a Columbus CRA over another jurisdiction. So the only component that qualified for us was this this tiny little corner right here. The, the other project was down here uh, in this census tract, the Agler Road was the northern boundary of that census tract. And uh, so they really were, as, as Andy mentioned, very close together. But if you scroll up here, this and I, census tract uh, bounded by Steltzer and Agler, McCutcheon and uh, Alum Creek is kind of looking like Iowa, but this is all single fam. This is a large single family residential neighborhood. And so the thought was to be able to include this to combine the two uh, census tracts because this one is such a small portion, but also give the opportunity to the residents in those areas to utilize the program to make the improvements to their house. And um, it's this this program is a buy right once an area is established program and it's an application that goes into this the our housing division so it's very user friendly everything is on our website it's not that a single family homeowner would have to go back to city council to get approval to utilize this program they're able to access it off of our housing website um, and so this we wanted to extend the benefit to this this large residential single family area. And that is how we came up with this boundary um, that is slightly different. It is still based on census tracts, right? We look at the tracts and where the projects fell before we came up with this new uh, boundary. It's, it's still tracks urban. It's just a combination. And we had some parameters that we were able to work within uh, given that census tracts, when they're drawn, are not based on jurisdictions. So uh, there's there's pockets that are not all in the city of Columbus in certain census tracts. Thank you, Hannah. That definitely helps. And uh, to Trey and Andy, thank you for uh, your presentation uh, on both of the the projects that will be um, uh, included in the Northeast CRA. Uh, Director Stevens, do you have any additional comments on? Um, any other projects we discussed this evening? I do not. Uh, thank you, Chair Favor. I'd be happy to answer any questions as well as the development team with me. Okay. Council Member Favor, can I just say one thing at the, Absolutely. Uh, at the end? I just want to let uh, the whole team know that, you know, I think being so vested in the city as we are, this to me, this is a tremendous opportunity for an area that yes, is being combined, but from a from a, a, a geographic area to spur continued development in, in these areas. And I, I think this is a term to me, you know, I've been doing this for close to 25 years in the city. I think this type of opportunity is, is what's needed in order to keep pushing forward housing stock and quality housing stock in areas that, that are underserved. And, and I think this, this particular area combined census tract has been underserved for years. And I think these type of developments will continue to spur that de the development opportunities and the census track will help that with, with us and other developers looking at these areas. So I certainly appreciate the opportunity 
I'm working with the city staff, uh, you know, especially Director Stevens and, and Hannah has been really impactful in, in these conversations. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's a great opportunity to recap on uh, the, the individual projects themselves. At Woodfield, there'll be 240 units. Uh, 48 units uh, will be uh, affordable at a deeper affordability than uh, what the city's incentive policy already uh, requires. Um, and then at uh, the last project, and the name is escaping me right now, um, 480 units of which 96 units will be affordable at a deeper level of affordability uh, than uh, our sense of policy right now. So thank you to you both uh, for uh, the presentation. Um, I'd like to go ahead now and transition for a brief overview of the 2019 CRA report. Uh, Hannah Jones um, is with the Department of Development. Uh, I will turn the floor over to you to provide that report. Good evening, Chair Favor, Council Member Dorans. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, as you know, when we changed the policy, one of the requirements that we wanted to put in place was that we need to submit an annual report to Council no later than September 30th of each year. Um, this again enhances transparency, gives us an opportunity to talk about what's happening in the community and the changes we're seeing. So tonight, I'm just gonna hit on a couple of highlights. We submitted the report earlier this week. Um, what you will see in there is that two new CRAs were created, as Hannah stated earlier, the Kenny and Henderson one, as well as the Far East one, which is a Herman and Kittle uh, project as well. Um, and then we signed three affordable housing agreements that were directly related to the new policy. So one of them was the Kenny and Henderson one with preferred, um, and that reflects uh, 440 units total of which 44 um, will be affordable at 80 and 100 percent AMI. And then we actually had two agreements for smaller scale projects within existing CRAs. So one within the hilltop and one on the near east side. Um, as Hannah stated earlier as well, we have not had anyone take the buyout option, uh, which is very exciting for us as a community. I think Trey expressed well as well as our other development partners that there's a real investment in seeing Columbus succeed um, and then willingness to integration of affordable housing in all projects we have. So we're very excited to see people continue to engage in that way. Um, we received 312 phase one applications and 322 phase two applications. So as we've just actual abatement policy process requires two um, applications, one that says this is what we're going to do, and then one that says this is what we've done. So just to give you an idea of what the construction landscape looks like and that our team has been very, very busy this year. Um, we conditionally approved 214 of those phase one applications, which represents 1,248 units in our community, and that's just all housing. We um, certified 263 phase two applications, which were sent to the county auditor for assessment. And that represents 1,572 of construction. Um, so I also think back to your point earlier that you stated that we only build about 8,000 per year. The number of units that get abated are still very small on the scale of overall construction in our community as well. Um, and of those, it, we always want to point out, um, I think it was captured here very well tonight because we've had some large scale projects that really focus on affordability. The housing abatement tool is one that's very important for our nonprofit developers and just their normal business. Um, and so 98 of the units that were developed were by our traditional affording housing well, our affordable housing partners. Um, and these projects may not have been the four unit multifamily requirement. They didn't require agreements. They are just one more tool in the toolbox to ensure that that they can provide affordable housing options um, to the residents of Columbus. So we always like to highlight those to just remind people that it's not always the big scale stuff. It does also help um, on the home ownership and single unit work that our partners do as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you, Hannah. And this is only the second year that the report has uh, been provided. Uh, did you see much of a difference between last year's report and this year's? So this is actually the first full year that we have provided. Um, so we have not seen much difference because this is literally the first year that we've captured it. Um, we did a partial year report earlier because we did implement the policy halfway through the year. So this captures the entire year of 2019. Great. And um, you did this for each of the application phases. Uh, phase one, I think you said 312 applications. Phase two was, I'm sorry, I missed that. Phase two was 322, so only a very small difference. Great, great. Um, thank you. Oh, and um, I, I guess I could say just conceptually, uh, let's say for, for a developer, uh, we'll talk to developer specific here. Um, let's say that the, the project is complete uh, and uh, the city finds out that uh, they have failed to meet uh, uh, the requirement of uh, the affordability requirement. What happens then? I'm going to pass that back to Reed or the director to answer <laughs> as the experts. I am happy to to start that answer. <laughs> um, so there is an agreement that will, is required uh, for four or more unit projects that ties the, the project to the affordability requirement. Um, with that, there is going to be an annual monitoring that the city does with these projects. So we'll capture the information from the agreement and then our team on an annual basis will send out a report um, to, the, to anybody that we have an agreement with. The information will be sent back to us to be monitored to make sure that they are in compliance with what is captured in the agreement. If they are not in compliance through that annual monitoring process, they're in chapter 4565 of the city code, but there is a very long and in the agreement, uh, there's a cure period that you have up to, I believe it's either, Rita, I'm looking at you, is it 90 days? It's either 60 or 90 days um, to, to cure. And then from there, there are additional steps, um, fees, fines, and then, uh, after you get through so many levels of non-compliance, the abatement is revoked. So there is the opportunity to cure, but then there's also the opportunity in that agreement if the project is no longer compliant to revoke the, the abatement. Okay, I, I just wanna make it clear that there is a, um, a balance, a check and a balance that's happening here with this process. Um, and uh, no one is um, in the business of, uh, handing out incentives without confirming uh, that uh, we are receiving the benefit that we bargained for. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right. I think we are ready to move uh, on um, to our public testimony uh, portion of the program. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we received written testimony from four community members that will be entered into the record. I'd especially like to acknowledge comments from Brenda Gishel with the Schumacher Place Civic Association. I wanna take this opportunity to remind our residents that the housing incentive policy is up for review in 2021. And I'm looking forward to working with the Department of Development to examine the current policy and making the appropriate changes to ensure we have fair policy that is truly advancing affordable housing opportunities across Columbus. I will be sure to, will be sure to share updates as that work moves forward. Uh, we do have one person speaking via WebEx this evening. That person is Joe Motil. Mr. Motil, please state your name um, and any organization you're affiliated with. Uh, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman Favor. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I always want to check. Uh, Joe Motil, I, I represent myself. I, I support the proposed projects that have been uh, presented this evening and their tax breaks. I'm a little disappointed with the ones in the Northeast CRA, uh, considering the low percentage of set aside AMI units uh, being about 138 out of 728 units. 
Uh, but this city council and Mayor Ginther's ongoing city income tax incentives and property tax abatement policies are allowing camp your campaign contributing developer friends and others to steal and survive from the trough of our city operating revenues to live in luxury while neighborhoods, families, and individuals of lesser means suffer. Unnecessary CRAs like Grandview Crossing, the Quarry, and Kenny and Henderson were established for the sole purpose of giving favored developers like Wagon Brenner and Preferred Living a tax abatement and risk-free development areas of Columbus. The city is saturated with CRAs and enterprise zones in Short North, Rickenbacker, Downtown, Italian Village, Easton Polaris, and other risk-free development areas of Columbus, and they've aided in making Columbus the second most economically segregated city in America. We can no longer give away city income tax or tax abate your way out of neglecting your duty to proportionately invest in neighborhoods that have been ignored for decades while spending tens of millions of taxpayer dollars to protect the investments of developers in corporate Columbus who control city hall policy, city council members, and the mayor. Those of us who are paying our fair share of property taxes and city income tax are getting killed financially, while those who aren't are getting fat. And if you want to give a tax break to a developer who wants to build a true affordable housing project for those under the 80% AMI on Sinclair Road or in the far south end, then give them one. That's fine. And do it for other similar, similar affordable housing projects as well. But there is absolutely no reason to blanket large areas for these tax abatements, especially when you have already given away the farm to those who don't need a dime of financial assistance. And if you want to truly help distressed areas in need of economic development, then start putting our tax dollars where it's needed. Put our money where your mouth is and start repealing these enterprise zones where they are no longer needed and stop giving city income tax breaks to Fortune 500 companies and preferential treatment to members of the Columbus Partnership. Just the mere fact that you're even talking about tax breaks at a time when tax revenues are deep in the red and people are suffering financially and personally from the impact of COVID is irresponsible and shameless. And will this greed ever cease? And when will you say no more? Director Stevens can spew all the garbage he wants about how tax abatements and city income tax giveaways creates jobs and economic development. Tell that to the people in the hilltop in Linden south and east sides about how these tax incentives had trickled down to them over the last 10, 15 years or so. So until city council can come to grip with the obvious and flushes the Kool-Aid out, <laughs> you will then see the light that we cannot tax abate our way out of poverty. The city's misuse and blanket tax abatement policies give to the rich and take away from the thousands that you claim you are providing equal opportunity for. Thank you. Thank you, as always, Mr. Motil, uh, for your comments. And uh, I, I hear, I hear you. Um, I understand that we're working with an imperfect system here. Um, as chair of housing, I can only speak to um, that specifically this evening. Uh, my in, my intent um, and excuse me, my intention uh, on. Um, being intentional on any project uh, that is receiving uh, an incentive. Um, and as you can see these this evening, um, all four projects uh, did not happen overnight. Uh, these are years in the making. Um, and to be fair, um, some of these deals, uh, some of these converse, most of these conversations took place uh, before I was even a member of Columbus City Council and um, in conveying um, my deep concern uh, for our lack of affordable housing, um, as well as our eviction crisis. Um, we have two of those projects uh, that uh, rose to the occasion um, and have gone deeper in their affordability than what is already on the books. Um, and so um, your, your comments are well taken. Um, I take this job very seriously. Um, I am being uh, very intentional uh, about um, how we have this conversation around affordable housing uh, and resolving um, uh, the obstacles that are before us as it relates to housing. Uh, thank you for attending this evening. Um, I'd also like to uh, provide an opportunity for Dave Paul, uh, if he is on the call. Dave, are you there? I do not have Dave Paul listed as an attendee. Okay. All right. 
Well, thank you again to um, Director Stevens and, and my apologies. Director Stevens, uh, did you want to uh, make uh, provide a response to Mr. Motil? No, but I want to thank you, uh, Chair Favor, for giving us this opportunity to talk through some of these projects and uh, the thought behind our approach to these tax abatements. I think it's we're seeing some significant investment uh, throughout the community that's going to help address some of our housing needs. So um, appreciate the support that you provide and, and the work that our developers on this call are doing throughout our city. Thank you, Director. Um, to the Department of Development and all of our guests that are presented here today, um, I appreciate your time as well as the work that has been done to get these projects developed uh, for our residents in need of housing. Um, I, the people might be getting tired of me talking about affordable housing uh, and uh, our need to, to come together as a community and all take part in uh, ensuring that we are um, all contributing to resolving uh, this issue and making sure that uh, when we're talking about equity, uh, that we're having a true conversation about what that actually looks like. Um, and so I, I truly do appreciate uh, the department uh, for uh, working with me and uh, getting ready to embark on some uh, some creative, uh, we'll call it a creative legislation around resolving uh, this issue, but that's what it's gonna take. Um, we, we can't abate our way out of this problem and I don't want to abate our way out of this problem. Um, but I also know that uh, we've got some serious system constraints um, and those are some things that are outside of my purview, but what's in my purview, uh, I will absolutely work towards. Um, and so with that, I, I thank everyone for their time and have a wonderful evening.